All right, so I'm back in yet another video, and once again, I'm talking about some of my classic Nikon rangefinder cameras. And once again, I have two cameras that at a glance are pretty much identical. And again, they're pretty much identical. We have uh, two examples of Nikon SPs right here. Uh, we have this one right here, which is the classic example. This is actually a very early production model that would have come out around 1957. And it has its original 50 millimeter F2 lens. Uh, this is what pretty much all Nikon rangefinder cameras were sold with. And people were usually given the option of upgrading to the, the faster 50 millimeter F1.4. Quite a few people did that, especially with the, the high-end SPs. The SP was the professional camera at the time and was really one of the only professional cameras in Nikon's lineup. So a lot of people who were spending that extra money on the SP were more than happy to spend the extra money on a faster lens, which at the time was faster than pretty much anything Leica made and uh, on par with most of the Carl Zeiss lenses because as a lot of people probably know, these cameras are very inspired by the Carl Zeiss cameras. Um, over here, we have a slightly different camera. Again, it's an SP. Uh, it's obviously black, but this is not uh, a standard SP. This is a special edition one that was introduced in the year 2005. They were really only sold in Japan through, from what I understand, was sort of a lottery type system. Uh, it came equipped with a very different lens. Instead of having a 50 millimeter, like pretty much all other Nikons, it had a 35 millimeter f 1.8. And I think it's somewhat debatable. But I think it's fair to say these are kind of reproductions because they are not identical to the original cameras. They're very, very close matches, and I'm sure some parts are identical, but you will notice there's little things like the film advance lever and some of the little knobs on the bottom that are not identical. And uh, I think as far as a, a reproduction, as we'll call it, goes, this is a very good camera. It does pretty much everything the original did. You get this very nice lens. There was an original 50 millimeter f1.8 lens that was released uh, with the initial run of the cameras, but it was pretty expensive and rare. Uh, I think they were a little bit different. I think this aperture ring around the nose was silver instead of black, and those lenses were also single-coated, where this lens was multi-coated as well as the, there was also a special edition S3 that came out around the year 2000. It had a 50 millimeter lens that was also multi-coated. Uh, so essentially, I'm just gonna compare these two cameras and uh, highlight a couple of the very small differences between them. And I'm also gonna discuss is it worth it to buy these cameras? Because, um, you know, obviously you have these older cameras, they're not cheap, but they're not terribly expensive, and you have these newer collector's cameras that, are, you know, they're a little shinier and nicer, but they are vastly more expensive. And I see a lot of discussion about this on the internet, and I'm gonna throw my two cents in. Uh, first of all, I'll go over a couple things with the SP. I'll start by taking off the leather case, and as I do that, I'm gonna compare the cases between the two of them. Uh, right here, I just have the bottom part of the case. I do have the top part that uh, folds over the top and front for both cases, but I'm just not going to pull them out because it kind of gets in the way. Uh, so this is the original one right here. It's not in terrible shape. It definitely shows some wear and tear. You'll notice it's a pretty thick, like, cowhide leather and it has sort of a felt lining. Uh, all the little attachments are brass. You can see the brass actually shining through on a lot of them. The original strap was long since deteriorated away, so I kind of made this one out of some uh, cowhide leather and some little split rings. And it, uh, it doesn't really match at all, but it works well enough. And uh, I think overall it's very well made. It has kind of cracked over the years, but this is like 60 years old. So it's kind of impressive it's held up. Uh, they do have an interesting feature. There's a little bit of a window here that lines up with the bottom of the camera. So you can actually kind of tell what uh, film speed you're shooting. If you need to reference it for a light meter or something. Uh, see both of them have that. This is obviously the reproduction one. It's made out of the much cheaper kind of artificial leather that is for some reason called genuine leather, even though it's very obviously a fake leather. Uh, it does have the original straps. Uh, it's much newer, so they held up a lot better. Um, you'll see it has very similar fittings and everything. You will notice the knob on the bottom. It does seem to be a solid piece of brass on this one, whereas here it seems like it's a, something a little lighter, maybe aluminum or something. But all in all, I'd say they're, they're pretty comparable. Given the air in which they're made, I, I think they're exactly what you'd expect. I don't think you'd really expect any more or any less from either of them. And both of them do a job. Uh, so I think that's enough for the, uh, the cases right there, because I'm, I'm sure people are just thrilled to learn about those. We'll kind of move on to the cameras now. And if I remember, I think there's still a roll of film in the SP, so I'm not going to open this one up. This one should be empty. Though. Do I mark it? So you'll, you'll notice it is kind of interesting on the, the bottom dial. They do have a little E for empty, so you can kind of mark it and note that it's empty because they don't have the little uh, the film tab like a lot of later cameras had. Uh, so looking at these two cameras side by side, uh, from what I've seen, the viewfinders are pretty much identical. Uh, the rangefinders both work very well. 
You'll notice all the little fittings for the uh, like the this timer and everything, and most of the stuff on top is pretty much identical. Uh, if you look on the bottom, you will notice a couple little differences. You'll notice that the um, the printing where it says open and close is relatively small on the classic version, and it's notably larger on the reproduction. And similar with the little knobs that show the film, you'll notice the colors are different. The original one is in both white and orange, and it says ASA. Well, the reproduction is in all white, and it says ISO, something that I guess resonated a little bit more with modern photographers. Uh, you'll also see there's no maker's mark on the bottom of the uh, of the original SP, where the 2005 one very clearly says made in Japan. I think that's kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know exactly why they made that choice. I guess uh, I guess back in the day they were trying to kind of pass these off as being high-end European cameras, and now they've kind of embraced their history and providence a little bit more. Uh, looking at the top of the cameras again, one big thing you can notice if you see these cameras is the the serial number. Uh, the standard SPs have this seven-digit serial number right there, and the special edition SPs say SP and then have a four-digit serial number, because again, they only made about 2,500 of these. If you find the Special Edition S3s, I think their serial number is much more in line with a classic S3 where it's seven digits, but it is it is a distinct set of digits that kind of, if you know what you're looking for, you can note it as being a Special Edition S3 and not the standard one, because they're very hard to distinguish. Uh, what else do we have? That's pretty much it for the camera bodies. I know there's one little difference here. So this is an early production SP, this is the classic one, and it has a, a machined film advance lever. It was a solid piece of metal, but you can see they've kind of gotten in there and, and cut out a little bit of the metal to make it a little bit lighter. And uh, most standard models just have a pressed piece of tin, and uh, the vast majority of them have that. But when we get to the special edition one, it is a completely solid piece of metal. It doesn't look like it was really, you can see there's just a tiny bit of tooling on the inside, there's a little bit of a dent and some, uh, some grips there, and just a, again a little bit of a tooling mark on top. And uh, this is much more in line with something you'd find on like a, a Nikkor Mat or a Nikon F and not so much any sort of SP. I always found that interesting because to me that's one of the most distinguishing features of this camera. Uh, the lenses are, again, they're different enough. I don't know if it's really worth comparing them. You have a 50mm f2 that is single coated, 35mm f1.8 that's multi coated. Uh, I mean, make of that what you will. There are, of course, um, if you get the S3, there's a 50mm f1.4, sort of a special extended barrel version, which is also higher quality than the standard lens and multi-coated, but those are pretty expensive. And, of course, there's classic, uh, there's the 35mm f2.5 for the classic cameras. It's very easy to find. And there is technically a 35 f1.8, but it does look a bit different, and they're very rare, and I believe they're single-coated. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I'm pretty sure they're single-coated. Uh, so now that I've kind of gone over these cameras and shown you everything I can, I think um, there is a bit of a... There are some differences on the inside. Again, I'm not going to open the SP because it does have film in it. But if you look on the inside of the Special Edition SP, you won't really notice anything. But if you look on the inside of this early, um, early production model, there are four patent numbers kind of stamped in there. And later models actually have six patent numbers. Uh, so you do have a couple of ways to distinguish the camera and its age and providence and everything. Uh, this shutter fire there. Again, there's uh, there's really not a whole lot to go into detail about the differences. They're pretty similar. Uh, one thing to note is with the these SPs, um, they did actually come with a reproduction of a lens hood and a lens cap that were very vintage, like tin lens hood and lens caps that were. Things you probably would have found on earlier Nikon lenses than this design. I think most of that stuff was actually discontinued by the time they made it to the SP, but it does have a very vintage look. I have all that stuff over on a shelf, but I'm just not going to pull it out. It also came in a reproduction box that looked uh, pretty much identical to the box the original SP came in, because strangely enough, I actually have the boxes for both of these cameras. Um, and it also this one also came with a special certificate of authenticity, and it had the, uh, the actual individual camera number. And another interesting thing is the camera number and the lens number uh, they match. It's the same number. So if, you, if you're buying one of these and you notice they have different numbers, or if you're buying one of these black SPs and it just has a 50mm f2 lens, you know there's a little something up there. Um, so one thing I see online a lot is a lot of people really lust after these special 2000 edition S3s and 2005 edition SPs, and they some people have insisted they need the newer one. They can't get by with a vintage camera because 
I guess some people are afraid that um, because they are pretty old, there might be issues like the, the range finder might be misaligned or that the shutter speeds might not be very accurate. But if you've watched my videos, you know that realigning the shutter speeds on these cameras is actually very easy. Um, I'm going to give you my two cents on this. I usually don't like to talk about price, but I am going to talk about price on these cameras. I, I almost never tell anybody what I paid for a camera because um, I, I just I don't find it to be all that important. And sometimes I'm embarrassed to admit that I paid a ton of money for some stupid camera that only me and a handful of other people are interested in. But with both of these cameras, I think I got a very, very good deal. Uh, so for this SP, I bought the camera with all the, the camera lens, all the accessories, the box, everything. I paid 3,100 US dollars, and that was around 2018, I believe, or I guess it was technically very, very late 2017, because I bought this as a Christmas present to myself. And while you think that's a lot of money for a fake old film camera, you have to realize that these cameras by themselves, like just this right here, very frequently sell on eBay for four or five thousand dollars. And the full box where you have the um, the lens, so the lens cap, the leather case, the certificate of authenticity, the original box, a set like that will almost always sell for five thousand to. I've seen them go for six thousand um, dollars. So I think I got a very good deal, uh, and I, I jumped on it because I saw it and I thought, hey, that's a pretty good deal. Uh, was it worth it? It's hard to say. I, I had the money. Uh, I probably could have spent it in a better way, to be honest, but I really wanted one of these cameras for a while, and that was the best deal I'd ever seen by a significant margin, so I jumped on it. And honestly, I don't really have any regrets. I, uh, I use this camera some. I don't use it a whole lot because it is expensive and because I you know, have an identical camera here. Uh, but I've used it. I've shot some Kodak Ektar in it, and it looks beautiful with this lens. I've shot a few different brands of black and white film, and they all came out looking pretty good. I've swapped it out, and I've put my vintage 85mm f2 lens on here every once in a while, and it gets very good results with that. Uh, I, I don't, despite the price, I don't really have any um, any regrets with it. For this uh, vintage SP right here, which again is an early production model, which a lot of collectors in the know will be able to identify them and are willing to pay more for them. I got the camera, I got this 50mm f2 lens, I got the original lens hood for it, I had the original box, it wasn't in great shape but not bad, and I got the, the leather case, which again was pretty worn but a nice little thing to have, and I paid $700 for this, and that was in, oh boy, when was that? I think it was sometime in mid-2020, I believe. And the thing is, you're thinking, that's a lot of money for both those cameras, but I, I think these SPs, normally sell for a thousand dollars or more. So I think I got a very good deal on both of these cameras. Because uh, like I said, normally this would be a thousand, normally this would be over four thousand, maybe five thousand. I got this for seven hundred, I got this for like little thirty one hundred. Is it a lot of money to spend on a camera? Yes. Do I really need two cameras that are pretty much identical? No. I got a little overzealous and bought this one because I knew it was a good deal. Um, it, you know, I, I'm not going to try to justify my actions. I know it's my weird little collection. It's my money. I'm going to buy what I want with it. But uh, the big debate I've heard is that a lot of people will insist on having these newer cameras and they, they act like they're willing to pay a lot more money for them and they, they get all excited because they get some vague idea that these cameras are like unused, which is probably not true because we're in early 2021 right now when I'm shooting this video. So that means this camera has been out in the world for at least 15 years. I'm not the first owner. I know that. I, I got the camera. The box was a little beat up. You can tell it had a little bit of wear. Somebody obviously mounted a, a shoe on it. Uh, if you look really closely, there's just a bit of a scratch somewhere on the lens barrel. It's in very good shape, but it clearly was not unused. And I think mine was in much better shape than a lot of them because it included the original box. I see a lot of these where it's just the camera and the lens. Maybe you get the lens hood or the lens cap. Usually it's one or the other. The original box, the certificate of authenticity have been thrown away. The uh, leather case is often sold off separately for some reason. So I, in considering that a lot of those cameras are selling for $4,500 on average, I, I don't know if it's worth the money. Because again, you can get a vintage SP uh, for about a thousand bucks. I mean, you're getting a different lens. I know a lot of people will say, oh, well, I really want this 35 millimeter f1.8 lens. I've heard that from a couple of people. And I would say, all right, fair enough. But at the same time, you can go out and you can buy one of these vintage SPs for around a thousand dollars. I've seen them go for, yeah, I've seen them go for more and less. It's, it's kind of tough because a lot of times when I see them going for more, they include like a 135 millimeter lens or 
some interesting little bits and pieces like a filter set. I've seen some that come with the old Nikon flashes. They have the little kind of fold up metal uh, ring, but those, those need a flash bulbs. So they're not really very functional in this day and age. Um, but you can buy this camera with a 50 millimeter lens like this for a thousand dollars or less. And then you can go out and you can buy uh, the vintage ver version of this lens, the 50 millimeter f1.8, um, which is, it is single coated, but it's a very, very similar lens. Not quite identical, but very similar. You can pick this up on eBay all the, pretty much any time for about $700. So you could pick up a set with this camera, this lens, and essentially this lens for $2,000 or less. That, that's pretty easy to do. And when you consider that that camera, this camera set, a vintage set with two lenses, costs a little bit less than half of this modern day set, I really think you should go with the vintage set. Um, I know a lot of people will get upset and say, oh, well, you know, the, the viewfinders can get messed up in the SPs. I've never had that happen. I've never even really heard about that happening. I don't even know what they're talking about. It doesn't seem like the rangefinder would really get thrown off. You do have the little uh, the lines that show the um, the actual frame lines for the lenses. I, I mean, I guess those could get messed up a little bit, but it's not like they're going to be unusable. They'd just be, uh, they look a bit weird. They wouldn't look quite as appealing. They'd still be usable, but they might be, they might not have that perfect symmetry that people like to see where they kind of narrow in like a little targeting mechanism. So I don't really know what people are talking about with the viewfinder issues. And yes, the, the shutters can sometimes get thrown off. But as I've shown in my other videos, it's actually very easy to, to recalibrate the shutter. So I, I would really suggest people, if you want to buy one of these cameras, I, I would say probably go for the vintage camera. And if you buy the vintage camera and you really like it, then at that point you might want to step up to one of these more modern sort of collector's cameras. Because the problem with these cameras are they were made in limited numbers. They were sold at a very high price to collectors. They are a collector's piece. They weren't really intended to be used. It, it seems really obvious to me, given the fancy box they came with and all the little accessories and stuff. This is something that was intended to be put on a shelf by a collector to be like, oh, look at my great Nikon collection. Um, and I just, you know, I, I use mine some, but I use it very sparingly because I would just, I don't know what I do if I drop this thing and got a big dent on it or I, I scratched it up a whole bunch. It's not even in perfect condition and I would feel terrible about it. Uh, I have seen a couple of people who have these vintage cameras and they carry around them, they carry, carry them around everywhere and they use them a lot and they have brassing and stuff on them. And I mean, that's fine if people want to do that, but I, I, I don't know if they realize that that is going to destroy the resale value and that they could, again, buy an older camera that's pretty much identical for a fraction of the price. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's their choice. I'll let them live with it. Uh, you know, it doesn't really affect me that much. But that's just kind of my two cents right there on uh, Nikon rangefinders, the new and the old. Um, I don't know where I can go from here. I've kind of gone over pretty much all my collection. So if you want any more information, uh, just drop a line in the comments. And I'll uh, see if I can put together another video. So hopefully you enjoyed that one and have a good day.